Thank you for listening to Remake Rewind, the podcast where we decide if remakes or reboots should have happened. I'm Mike, as always. And with me, I've got my co-host, Alex. How you doing, Alex? I'm doing all right. How's the quarantine been for you? Uh, <laughs> it's still happening, that's for sure. I'm I'm very tired today, I'll tell you. I feel more tired in quarantine than when I was out and about and I've got so much more time for activities. I'm actually going out. For, I'm going on multiple walks sometimes. Like I think we're all a lot more time, but it's just feeling I think we're all, Yeah. We're, we're exhausted from the existential dread. And it's just, I mean, it's been obviously been said time and time again by everybody. We're, there's, we're not going to have a fresh take on the year 2020, but every month really <laughs> has been worse than the previous month. It's been a bright spot how effective the protests have been. It's I nice, agree. It's nice seeing some change get um, But what it, it also affected. infuriates me how much progress has been made in so little time with these protests where it's just like we've had all these people who had mm -hmm. the power to make this change and we yeah. haven't. Yeah, you know, uh, Nancy Pelosi is out there in her little costume kneeling or whatever. It's like, yo. You're the one that can do something. You exactly. Stop. Well, then it's just you don't kneel. We kneel. You do something. It's just so sad that it, all it took, really. I mean, obviously the protest had its thing, but it wasn't until white people got pissed about this shit that politicians start to listen, and that's just yeah. And absurd. we all we needed was you know three months of free time. Well, yeah, and it, it, one, it's that, and I, Katrina and I have been talking about it a lot, and as much as we've always thought we were allies, and anytime you know some aspect of police brutality would pop up on the news you know we would be tweeting about it and being angry about it but in terms of having any real call to action we didn't and so that's that's been interesting trying to realize that you know there is more that we can do especially me as like a cis white male there is a ton of privilege and i a lot i've had a lot of arguments with people i've lost some family members over the last couple of weeks in terms of them just not getting that white privilege is a thing yeah and I've had to come to terms with that, but it's totally fine. Like, I don't want people who are racist, who, who are unwilling to change for the better in my life. Yeah. So it's 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 weird that we've had so much change so quickly, and that that really pisses me off because it's just like we've had we've had people in position who could do this, and they just waited until it reached a boiling point instead of doing things. And even with all the change, like there's still a lot to be done with like Breonna Taylor. Yeah. They named a law after her, but. Cool. One of the guys just got fired a couple of days yeah. ago. Yeah, so. and you know they're murderers. Yep. So I wish I, could, I wish I could murder somebody and just get fired from the podcast right. and not right. A, you know. It's it's just absurd. And I, I've got like I said, I've gotten a lot of fights with family members um, over the last few weeks because it's just like it's no longer okay to just to be quiet and everything and. You know, with the podcast, we've kind of gotten back to business as usual for the most part in terms of what we're posting. But, you know, I do think as important as a brand, we speak out. And so I'm still on the MDX Pods Twitter every day tweeting at the mayor of Los Angeles to yeah. fire Police <laughs> Chief Michael Moore. And then yeah, resign. And it's, it's a small thing, but I think it's important that as a brand, we speak I think it's out important what's to, right. Yeah, I think it's important to keep momentum going. And I, uh, I posted... We're like patting each other on the back now for our Instagrams. I just, you know, I'll acknowledge that. But I, I posted a lot of support stuff on my, on you my posted Instagram a ton. the past couple of weeks. Every day. Yeah. You're posting and I just, five, six things a day about, yeah, I'm very impressed with what you've been doing. But yeah, like he's patting ourselves on the but back. I, <laughs> but I just recently started posting, you know, personal stuff again. But I'm trying to keep it balanced, you know? Yeah. Because, you know, you want to post a picture of what you ate for dinner or something. But definitely interspersing it with other helpful support yeah information we can't go back to normal yeah so yeah so you know we're a political podcast now um <laughs> <laughs> no but like what we're doing right now i think is it's kind of the equivalent of that it's important to talk about it a little bit and um yeah man Black yeah Lives i agree yep i i now getting back to normalcy to an extent let's let's bring up the topic that we're talking about today what what movies did we watch and what are we going to be talking about over the next hour or so i realized as we were watching these by the way that they're pretty timely for what's going on right now i think this is a really good choice of movies um i think so, so too we, yeah we watched the original lady killers from 1955 and the remake that the coen brothers did in 2004 
Yep. I I hadn't seen neither of these films going into this. Oh, really? And, and I've been I wanting saw, to watch the Lady Killers. I saw Killers, the remake. The Con- oh, yeah? Yeah, I saw the remake I, when it came out. Oh, did you? See, but I didn't, I but I didn't even to, know it was a remake. I, I wanted to watch that for quite a while. Uh, I don't know why I didn't watch it when it first came out. I was, you know, 16 when that one, the, the 2004 sure. one came out. Uh, but it's been on my list to watch for years. And then when the podcast started, it's just been waiting until we covered it on the podcast. I wasn't going to watch it outside of the podcast knowing that we'd ultimately cover it. But yeah. I'm a huge Coen Brothers fan. I, yeah. I'm not going to apologize for it, okay? <laughs> for being <laughs> a Coen Brothers opinion, fan? But they are very capable filmmakers. You know what? Ice cream tastes delicious, and I will not apologize for that. I stand by <laughs> my belief that sweet things are, are good in my tummy. And, and damn anyone who disagrees. I was really excited to go and watch um, both of these. I, I know the. I was the, excited I knew, to revisit it. Yeah, I don't mean watch both of them, but especially to revisit the Coen Brothers one. I, I, really I knew it. the original one, uh, starring Alec Guinness, is is considered one of the best uh, British movies of all time. I think I saw that it was ranked like nine as like the best British comedy of all time, and like thirteen as like best British movie of all time. So I knew that Alec Guinness was. Um, how do I want to put it? A, you know a real actor a serious actor and like when he did star wars he was kind of like this is he was miserable me, but i'm gonna do yeah. it you know but i've never seen any of his other movies uh i've, just I've not... only seen uh bridge over river Kwai. yeah i mean I, i'm embarrassed to say that i haven't seen that i've seen i've seen that and there's one other movie that i've seen like i, I went through his filmography mm. on imdb as i was watching the movie because i felt bad as well i'm like i know him yeah. for, as obi-wan yeah. And that's re- and I knew River uh, Bridge Over River Kwai, but I was like, what else has I see- have I seen him in? And he's done a ton of movies. Yeah. So this was cool to um to see him doing something completely different. What's what's weird about about it though is he he thought this this role should have gone to somebody else, Al- um Alistair Sim, and he basically based his performance on Alistair Sim, even to the like his costuming, his putting on prosthetics, fake teeth fake nose and everything like that like if, if you got to appreciate know, it was Alec i never know yeah i i sort of, i recognize his voice more than his uh than his appearance see that's funny um, is the voice is the thing i recognize the least like i didn't recognize him because i'm so used to the obi-wan voice which is very distinct you got to appreciate the lack of ego to do that by the way like I he agree. just thought that this other person was right for the part they weren't going to do it and then he still believed that that was the right way to go for the part and he just recreated another actor. It's fucking cool. Yeah. I, and I think I, I could talk all day about him. I thought he was fantastic in this movie. I, I loved his. He's my favorite part. Creepy, yeah. Sorry. He's my favorite part. Oh, for sure. He, I mean, they gave names to the other members of the crew, but yeah, there's like short round and the pink Panther. Yeah. First round, uh, heart Italian uh, mobster guy. Yeah. Lewis. But they, with the exception of, Luigi. I'd say one round and Lewis, like Harry didn't have much agency. He didn't have much going on for him. Yeah, that was, we can get into that later, but that was a big difference that I noticed between the two movies. I, I agree. So do you want to give us the, uh, the 90 why second you, elevator pitch? Why don't you do this one and I'll do the next one. Oh, I would love to do it for you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Music this movie ears. was a, uh, Eatling production film, uh, starts with a really sexy man banging a gong. You stole my thing. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I, that was my very first note. I was like, damn, this guy's like really it's going to town on this gong. My first note, too. He's all like bronzed and oiled really up. giving it, it to that gong. Wow. It was, yeah. it was a sight. Uh, so basically, <laughs> the premise of this movie is uh, Professor uh, Marcus, who knows if he actually is a professor or not, but played by the amazing Alec Guinness. He hatches the scheme to rob a bank and use an old woman's house as a, a staging ground uh, for the, the heist itself and also tricked her into being part of the heist. And it was supposed to be the easiest crime in the world, but uh, this woman is a bit of a handful. She really likes to stick her nose in other people's business, and that ultimately led to the demise of the entire crew. Yeah, it's uh, it's a perfect plan that falls apart. Yeah. The only thing I didn't get about the movie, and maybe I missed it because I was taking a note or something, but I missed the part where they got uh, Mrs. W to decide to go and get the money. 
other than that, like the whole plot made sense to me, but yeah. I don't recall seeing them getting you know, hurt. Like I remember them saying like, oh, we shouldn't get her involved. But then I just saw her picking up the money and I was like, when did they talk to her about this? I don't remember seeing it. The whole robbery is very murky to me. And yeah. I don't know if it's because it, I don't know if that's um, the movie, not just not conveying it clearly enough or if i was checking out because i was bored or if i had just uh you know looked at my phone at that moment um but the robbery didn't like do do anything for me it feels it, like it should be kind of a set piece you know i i agree like when you look at and i think they other, intended for it to be but it just didn't, didn't it, it like didn't feel that way to me either like when you look at some of the other british capers like uh the italian job uh that's some a good chunk of the movie is the actual heist and getting ready for the heist where this movie, it felt like the heist was almost an afterthought and it was really yeah. the before the heist and the after the heist, um, which yeah. honestly, the majority of this movie is about the demise of the robbers. Yeah. Which makes sense. Cause I think that's sort of the, the drive or the message of the movie. It, is I, like I these agree. guys getting their comeuppance. Um, but yeah, it feels like it should be divided into the, it divides really easily into three parts where it's the setup and like setting all the pieces in place for who our crew is and how they're in this, uh, this old woman's house and the problem that she might present later and then the heist and then comeuppance, you know? Yep. And it feels more like it's the two bookends and a very short heist in the middle that like feels uh inconsequential to the rest of the movie well and what i didn't understand and we're, we're obviously going to talk about the differences when we get to the second movie but for the life of me i couldn't figure out why they needed to rent the two rooms from this woman like in the second right. movie it makes a, a whole lot more sense and this yeah. is just like what what did the staging ground really have to offer like why couldn't they use some their one of their own homes or why couldn't they just rent a hotel room or anything yeah What's the proximity got to do with anything? Yeah, and it feels because... like that whole her whole house is like slanted, which is like it's interesting, and I like that it's. I in thought there, that was fun. That, yeah, it's fun, but it feels like another thing where that could have paid off in some way during the heist or or in during the comeuppance. Come up yeah, exactly. I agree. Like if if the house tilted while there's a perfect point when uh, uh, Harry, who's the first character who kind of has his comeuppance, he's up on the roof. It would have yeah. been great if the house teetered and that and he fell off the roof versus him falling off the roof because somebody was chasing him. Like well, the, the guy, house the guy pushed a, him off the roof, right? Well, he called it an accident, but it was because of the pursuit. But like, I think it would have been fun to make the character, the house, a character that yeah. ultimately led to the demise of some of these people because it was. Yeah, I mean, these guys, I guess, needed a place to plan their robbery which I don't know, do it in a bar or something like, yeah, could and, be I mean, I, I get not having the bar, but the whole having to, you know, haul instruments every time yeah. they wanted to come over here and then it's play so the complicated and, and there's no benefit. It, yeah. It, it makes no, no it. real sense. Now, yeah. that being said, I loved the old lady character, Mrs. W. Uh, yeah. Who they kept calling her. I thought she was so much fun. I, I love the opening of, you know, her going to the police station and telling constable that, you know, one of the her neighbors mentioned a, a spaceship, but she really <laughs> thinks the spaceship was because the kids were listening to like a radio play and she fell asleep. It's like she's just going to the the constable's office and just wasting his time. And yeah, she's a uh, she's a, an old so and so. Yeah, and then she has like her umbrella Funny that daddy? she keeps uh -huh. losing, yeah. and you know all these little things. I think her and Alec Guinness's character were really the only well rounded characters, where everybody else was kind of just orbiting flat yeah they were just there was no depth to any character other than these two but she she was great and how she was just a wonderful person and saw the best at everybody and how she really wanted to be part of her town and she always wanted to be helpful to the detriment of their plan multiple times and yeah. she's just a good person for the sake of being a good person and i yeah. really loved her character and we almost didn't get uh the actor who did this so um it was katie johnson who played uh mrs wilberforce uh originally the producers thought she was too old and they were really concerned that she would die before they finished the film so they hired a younger <laughs> actress who died like two weeks before they set to film so then they and ironically she was actually 23. 
<laughs> but yeah, I thought that was great. But I think she, she really, I, I was really excited every time she was on screen. Just like, how is she going to mess this up? Like, she felt to me like when everybody, when I was reading all this stuff about the Pink Panther and talking about like all the thing that Peter Sellers do does as, mm-hmm. as uh, Inspector Clouseau, mm-hmm. like, I felt her character kind of embodied that clumsily just causing havoc, but ultimately saving the day uh, better than it happened in the two Pink Panther movies we watched, you know, just a few weeks ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah I agree. Which, uh, did we say Peter Sellers is also in this, his first yeah, screen he, appearance? he is, and this is one of his early roles. Uh, he looks like he's, he's about 17. He's he's looks much younger. He's much heavier. Uh, when he, we yeah, he looks like a little Panther. donut. Uh, when we covered the Pink Panther, I mentioned he he went on a really strict diet because right, he wanted right. to look younger and fitter. So he would, uh, uh, fuck, I can't remember his the actor's name, but the the one who played the bad guy's nephew, he wanted to look mm-hmm. young and fit next to him, uh, Robert Wagner. Right. Um, right. But yeah, in this, he's he's easily got a good 30, 40 pounds on his older self in in Pink Panther. Yeah. yeah, he didn't do much. Apparently, all the uh, the parrot sounds in this in this movie were was Peter Sellers. Interesting, but beyond the well, parrots, you, know, you can't you can't hold that against him though. It's his first role. Yeah, he He's was very no early, and he was yeah. uh, apparently very intimidated working with Alec Guinness, who was, who was his, like hero. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. The uh, I read that the writer of the original um, dreamt this movie, and he said that when he was writing the script, all he had to do was remember his dream, but it like came to him fully formed. Huh? Yeah, that's I pretty, that was pretty cool. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. I I kind of really... fucking pretentious though. It, a little bit, but I'm you just, know, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. It's, it, it was a fun movie. Like, you know, this was, it kind of seems like a classic dark, tale. It does. But it, then also it feels dark instantly comedy. like a, yeah, it feels, but it feels like, um, it instantly feels like a story that has just always been around. Like it feels, yeah, like, it feels like a fable tale. of some kind. Like, yeah, exactly. Like there's a cautionary like, tale. Exactly. There's a comeuppance or whatever. There's these very like, um, specific, uh, archetypal characters. And, um, it makes sense that it would end up being remade, and especially by the Coen brothers, who are yeah, all about like, these modern day fairy tales. They're all about the modern day fairy tales, and they're all about being on the dark, seedy side of life. Like every mm-hmm. every one of their movies involves crime in yeah. in some fashion or another. And I, I now I'm not gonna say I haven't seen every Coen brothers movie, but I've seen the big ones. You know, I've seen um, the big Fargo. Ones, yeah. Uh, Fargo, uh, Oh Brother, Where Out. That was one of my favorite movies. Burn After Reading is in my top ten favorite movies of all time. Obviously, that's funny. That's, yeah, Burn After Reading is, uh, I think, underappreciated. I as is this movie. Brad frankly. Pitt's character in that movie. The, Brad, Kitt's, well, Brad Pitt's character in Burn After Reading was one of my favorite characters of all time in cinema. Uh, I think that's one of Clooney's really good. Like, um, what's the word when he's doing like crazy Clooney? Yeah, you know? he's great in that when he's just like eating the food. He's like, ah, I get a little anaphylactic. And as he's eating the shellfish, he's like, ah, you only live once. And he just starts eating things he knows he's allergic to. And then so no, funny. he's great. And he built uh, a dildo machine. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> anyway, anyway, <laughs> we could talk about uh, that movie for another hour. So I guess we should go into a little detail on this movie, you know, get into the plot a little bit more. Uh, yeah. So really the what happens with this is we see – uh, Professor Marcus twice before we really see him. We see him as a shadowy figure looking at a bulletin board as he overhears Mrs. W talking to like a merchant saying like, Hey, has anybody inquired about my ad? So then you, you know, you see a shadowy figure like grab the ad. Um, and then when he knocks on the door, it's just a shadow. And I thought that was a really great, great way of introducing him. Cause he's funky looking in this movie. Like when you see him, he's a, he's, he's still, a ghoul. Yeah. Like, like he, the baked it looks like, and the, Oh, he's yeah. so creepy. It looks like he's had an alcohol problem for a long time. You know, he, he looks he's like borderline pale and like clammy. a vampire. Like he looks yeah. like or like Wormtail in the Harry Potter movies. Like just <laughs> a sniveling, disgusting person. And yeah. but he has this charm. He looks like, like Obi Wan went to the dark side. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> but he he convinces Mrs. W to rent him two rooms, one for him to stay in, and the other one for his band, uh, who plays classical music. So that you can uh, 
you know, plan this heist. And <laughs> it's funny saying band. It sounds like they're in the Rolling Stones or something. Right. But, you know, they call them or an ensemble, whatever they call themselves. Yeah. And, you know, throughout the, you know, the first part of the movie, as we're getting to know the um, the characters and the plot or the, the actual plot to rob the, the bank, it's just Mrs. W coming in all the time and they having to scramble to go, you know, hit, hit play on the record or grab all their instruments and everything like that. But it was only, you know, done for a gag a couple of times. It was really just multiple times of them catching the parrot who kept getting out. Yeah. And I think that's where you kind of get a hint of the house as a character when they go to get the uh, parrot at one point. They're standing on top of a chair to get the armoire and then the chair collapses and their armoire collapses. And, you know, you get a little bit of that slapstick humor, mm -hmm. uh, which surprised me that and, you know, Peter Wellers did some of it. But, you know, it was really that big dude uh, one round who did most of the physical comedy in this movie. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, he's the one that fell through the chair. Yeah, and then you have so you have one round who was just kind of the the gentle giant who really came to mm -hmm. enjoy the company of Mrs. W. You had yeah. Harry, who I couldn't really tell you what Harry's role in anything really was, like what he yeah. brought to the team, and that was yeah. Peter Sellers. Right. And then we had Lewis, who was kind of the the dark horse, kind of wanting the, to uh, the Italian mobster Luigi. Yeah, he he wanted yeah. to just make it a more straightforward robbery. And that's where what I liked about him was he was just a seedy mobster who doesn't have really any kind of thought beyond the simple, easy take. And there's a point where he's like, well, why don't we just do it and then mail the money to us? And uh, Professor Marcus was like, that's exactly what they think we'd be doing. It would be robbing it and then getting it on the train. And sure enough, when you know they robbed the bank, the first thing that happens is the cops go to the the railroad uh, and they're like, hey, has, are there any outbound going packages? We need to stop all outgoing. So it's like Professor Marcus is really good at what he does. He's the brains. Yeah. And he's a lot of times with movies like this, you get somebody who's quote unquote the brains who is still in over their head. But in this case, he was cool, calm and collected the entire movie and mm -hmm. knew how to handle every person in this film, even Mrs. W to an extent until she was just too good. To, yeah. to be tricked by him what are the um what are the other characters there's the uh the portly balding white fellow the the right? big one yeah yeah so that's one no i mean round. no there's one round but then there's a there's a blonde guy too right yeah there... see like these the characters in this movie are like i'm not just trying well... to think well maybe we should go through how they die and that might make me remember so the first one that well, dies he's the first one that dies on the roof that's what i'm talking about oh that's right that wasn't harry I don't remember that guy yeah. at all. Yeah, see? Yeah, and then Harry, so then the second person who dies is Harry because he was supposed to kill Mrs. W and he chickens out and he tries to run off with the money. Um, right. But one round thinks he killed, that Harry killed Mrs. W, so one round hits him over the head with like a beam. Yeah. And then one round goes to shoot Lewis and Marcus but forgets to turn off the safety, so Lewis kills him. Yep. And then we have a little bit more of a scuffle with Marcus and and Lewis before they both ultimately come to their doom. So I forgot all about that first guy who fell I off think the roof. I, I want to come back to the way that Marcus or uh, the Marcus's character dies in the remake. So I want to detail his death in this one. So Lewis, they have a little scuffle. He ends up he, uh, he, he um, pulled a Mario Lew and used the echo in the pipes to to <laughs> lure yeah, Lewis Lew around. Lewis is Lewis is climbing. He's on a uh, they're both on a bridge or a uh, Marcus is on a bridge. This is terrible podcasting. Marcus is on a bridge. Lewis is climbing up a ladder to get to Marcus. And Marcus, before he gets there, uses a crowbar or something to pry the ladder off of the, the stone and makes Lewis fall into the trains that are going by underneath where they've been dumping the bodies. And on his way down, Lewis shoots Marcus, but Marcus is able to take it and, re and recover. He misses. He just barely nicks it. Like he misses him. Like yeah, yeah, that's clothing. right. But then Marcus uh, is underneath, you know, a train. Railroad sign. Yeah. And the sign comes down and hits him in the head and knocks him into the, um, into the car, into yeah. the train, which is interesting. I didn't, you know, I thought that flowed pretty well while it was happening. Um, I agree. I, I yeah. thought it was a fun little little chase and some more kind of slapsticky things. Like he's like yelling in pipes, like over here, Lewis. 
uh, so he's like yelling into the pipes. It's also London, so it's super foggy. So he's you know ducking and weaving, hiding behind things, and just making noises to just completely fuck with Lewis. Lewis cannot find him. It's actually a lot like the uh, the scene at the end of Heat with Robert De Niro <laughs> and uh, Al Pacino on like the uh, at the airport when they're just like running across the tarmac, and then they finally get to like those little like big power. Uh, I don't know what they were, but like Transformers, and they're just like hiding, like, hello there. <laughs> I'm actually due for a heat rewatch. We should do that. And um, the Irishman is spiritual. It's spiritual uh, sequels, just because it's the same crew. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, obviously not a, a sequel in any way, really, but right. cr- crime God, with De Niro and Pacino. The heat is such a long movie. It's good, but it is a long movie. So is the Irishman. Movie. Yeah, I haven't watched the Irishman yet. I oh, see, mad- we should do that. I was mad at Scorsese when when the Irishman was coming out because he disrespected your beloved Mar- uh, Marvel movies. Well, it was just disrespecting him saying the things he did. Just showed one that he's that a he's fucking discon- eighty year old man that he's disconnected. But to say that, shit. so the things that he was doing when he was young, people didn't necessarily consider cinema. Like he was not liked by the industry for the longest time. Uh, he still isn't the most loved man in the industry. Uh, he's always rubbed people the wrong way. So there's that element. But also it's just I felt he was kind of being a hypocrite when talking about, you know, Marvel movies are just amusement park. It's just there. It's not cinema. You don't need to spend, you know, a hundred million dollars on a movie to make a movie when he spent one hundred and sixty million on the Irishman. And the special I mean, and the whole draw to that movie a big part i'm not gonna say the whole draw but a big draw to that movie was the de-aging of these three powerhouse actors so it's like when you're gonna criticize a whole you know arguably some of the biggest movies of all time which not necessarily that doesn't necessarily mean they're the best movies of all time but to argue to say that these movies rely too much on their budget and too much on special effects when you just made 160 dollar 160 million dollar movie to make robert de niro look younger I You're think not wrong about any of that, but I also enjoy having divisive uh, voices in in the cinema and film industry. And the man, I agree. His, but he's Martin Scorsese. He can. He's there's enough done, space for everybody. He's done what he's done, and he can say whatever he wants. See, and I don't. I can, the thing is, I can hear him say that and say, "Oh, these movies aren't made for him." Right. I, I don't. But, it's water off my back. I don't thing, care. When you have somebody who is at the level he is just dismissing something that is almost universally beloved just kind of comes off as almost petty because he complained about shortly after he's like yeah i would have never been able to get the irishman in theaters and then he's got another movie he's working with with uh dicaprio that apple um is helping him make and he's complaining like yeah i'll never get my movies in in cinema and it's like dude you you had a movie in cinema not that long ago like wolf of wall street went into cinema and like was huge Like you can get your movies in, you just can't. There, no one's going to spend 160 million dollars on a cinema movie for you, Scorsese. You don't need 160 million dollars to make your movies. You're an amazing filmmaker. Why you don't need that much money? Make it for what you need to make it for, and it'll still be an amazing movie. So, to me, it just felt hypocritical. Yeah, doesn't bother me. Yeah. Well, (laughs) so are we done talking about the 55 one? No, I, I I've got a couple <laughs> things I want to talk about. That's the I, biggest sidebar we've the, ever. The had. ending, the ending was spectacular. I loved it. She, you know, the the whole time after they get the money, they trick her into getting it. They're about to get off, just completely free. But one round's bag gets caught in a door and rips, and like money flies everywhere. So now they have to spend a ton of time. So she finds out them. that she finds out that there's uh, all this money that they've this done crime. something. Well, and then like she has a bunch of friends come over. They're like, the bank just Tea got party. robbed, and <laughs> she figures it out. And so they spend the whole time talking to her, like, "Hey, this money is insured. Uh, if you were to report it, it's actually just going to complicate things. If you report it." They're going to think you were part of this because you were the one who went and got the money. We'll also tell them that you were the mastermind behind this whole thing because you want to fix your oh my house God. or something like that. Obi-Wan is trying to get her to come to the dark side. Yeah. Wow. Uh, he Jedi mind tricks her to the, yeah. the dark side. And she almost well, considers to. it a couple of times. Yeah. And she is just such a good person. She's not willing to do it, even though, you know, they're not technically wrong. Like, yeah, that money's insured. And it's, well, that's sort of the crux of both of these movies right. is, is a victimless crime, not a crime, right? Well, Did the they do is, something wrong? Is, is stealing wrong, even if nobody's getting hurt? 
Right. And and the thing that was weird about this one is now, obviously, back in 1955, it's a lot more money, but it's, it, like it was only 60,000 pounds. <laughs> and I was like, that's not that much. Let me you check know, the conversion rate of that. Yeah, it, it's it's probably several hundred thousand dollars. But hey, Siri, how much was 60,000 pounds in 1955 worth now? Oh, boy. 1,000 pounds in 1955. I got nothing. Okay, let me see if I can find it. <laughs> this is riveting podcast material. We're really killing it this episode. Just going on uh, tangents, looking things up on our phone, trying to cover up for the other person running off screen. So in today's worth, that's about 621,000 pounds. And how, I mean, I guess we don't have to look it up, but the, the pound compares pretty The pound's close more than the, the dollar. dollar. So... It's generally it's it's been as high as like three point one four pounds to the dollar, but mm. I think on average it's like one point four or something like yeah, that. Yeah, but say, it's I think it's, it's more. So six hundred thousand, it's probably closer to like seven hundred thousand American dollars. So still, I mean, yeah. for each person in the caper, there was five. I mean, they're they're getting approximately one hundred and twenty thousand dollars in today's dollars. Yeah. So it's not a small crime. It just sounded so much smaller than it actually <laughs> is. But yeah, ultimately. They, <laughs> they trick her and they're like, they were going to try to kill her, but not one by one, they couldn't do it. And so at the end of the movie, after they're all dead, well, she thinks they all disappeared. We should say they, they drew straws to try and kill her. And that's how Multiple they all times. Kind of end up getting their comeuppance is one by one. They either are unwilling or incapable of doing it. And they end up offing themselves until there's only two people left. Yep. And then. They then they take each other. other. Yeah. yeah. So they do that, and she ends up going to the police and telling this whole story, and they don't believe her, and they just to humor her, like, you keep the money. And we end the movie with two great little little gags. So she forgets her umbrella every time she goes anywhere. So her forgetting her umbrella almost caused them to get caught at the beginning of the caper because she went back to the scene of the right. crime to get her umbrella her also trying to stop a a guy who owns a horse from eating a fruit vendor's fruit almost got them caught <laughs> and so then at the end i think that's a, by the way i think that's a scene where i kind of checked out on the robbery yeah i didn't understand why that went on for so long it went on for a long time that was like I one was of the like, longest scenes here? and it didn't it didn't move the plot forward at all. It's just it didn't a horse eating stuff tense. from a fruit vendor. Yeah. yeah. So she gets, and then to the he falls and everyone laughs at him. Yeah. And you know, they, they talk about it quite a bit. Like, Oh, like, you know, the horse vendor is like, what? Like it didn't, it like became a procedural, like a cop showed up and he's like, hold on. What happened here? Yeah. It's super weird. But at the end of the movie, she tells the cops about it and they don't believe her. So they just to get her off their hair. Like was just like, yeah, you keep the money. She forgets her umbrella. And they're like, you forgot your umbrella. She's like, don't worry about it. I have a ton of money now. I'll buy my own umbrella. <laughs> and then she goes and gives a homeless man like a very large amount of money, like such a large amount of money that he's just like, Mrs., this is too much money. So we yeah. know she's going to be generous. And it's just, it ends on such a positive note. Yeah. And by the way, the cops fucking can't deduce that maybe she, it's worth investigating that she's telling the truth after she says that she has all this money to buy umbrellas and stuff. You're great. Well, it, it's, it's just absurd that, you know, you hear about the bank robbery and I, I get it's the boy who cried wolf kind of thing. But still, they, like you said, like, this is a hot crime. Like, why would she yeah. know anything about it at all? Yeah. Yeah. On the same day. That, like, you investigate it. Yeah. Just go check it out. Yeah. Yeah. You know, what's the big deal? Yeah. What are you, it's not like you're in a crime ridden town either. Like they make a point of saying how, at least in the remake, I think yeah. they do in the original, how, uh, how boring the town is. Yeah, they do. And that's why they humor her every time she comes in with her tall tales. So, yeah, I think we should uh, move on to the next one. But before we do, Paul, you're dripping with perspiration. Your color is very hectic. What have you been doing? You know damn well what I've been doing. So what have you been up to, bud? Um, well, I watched the 13th the other day. Oh, which was... I, I was planning on watching that in the next couple of days. Yeah, it's fantastic. It's really good. That's super, what I've heard. super heavy, as you can imagine. Um, but yeah, really well made. And, you know, I think you kind of get the the gist of it from reading the the um, synopsis or whatever. And it's like stuff that maybe we kind of know, but it goes so in depth 
on stuff that you know people like you and i especially are just not aware of right um that's fascinating you know and it's heartbreaking and um i recommend everyone to watch it because it's it's great um i watched die hard last night which was really cool oh, so good i know uh i rewatched the force awakens um the other day which i nice. love the force awakens it's a really good movie. It's so I don't much care fun. if it's retreading some old territory. They had to do that. I rewatched so I'm I'm watching all the Star Wars movies right now. And after watching the prequels, I mean I I believe what I'm about to say when Force Awakens first came out and people were giving it a hard time for being a retread of New Hope or a soft reboot or whatever. But especially after watching the prequels again. Um, this is a hundred percent the direction that they had to go with the sequels. They had at to least with that movie. give you some comfort food to like rebuild trust. In I agree. The brand the only the prequels thing I... are so bad and so yeah. not, you know, star Wars. To the a only extent. thing I don't like about the force awakens is how they waste all the guys from the raid. Like you get all the guys <laughs> from the raid and they yeah, don't do that anything. Was, that was a longer scene and it got cut down. Unfortunately. Yeah, I would have nice loved to see, to see more of their stuff. Eco uh, and I forget the other guy's name. Yeah. Um, I watched Due Date, which is a better movie than Joker. I thought that You've was cool. You've been talking about Due Date a lot. You brought up Due Date when we were watching uh, Sonic. <laughs> Did I? Yeah, you brought oh, up whoops. Due Date. You're like, uh, maybe it was just Sonic in my mind. And I, due date. and I was excited to watch it. Uh, yeah, I yeah love Due that Date, movie. you know, same. That's okay. It's same director as Joker and stars Zach Galifianakis and uh, Robert Downey Jr. Oh, I didn't and, know that was um, a Todd Phillips film. Yeah, that well, that's that's why okay. I said it's better than Joker. Like, there were moments in Due Date where I, and I, you know, I'm primed for this because um, he's carrying his the ashes of his father across <laughs> the country. Um, but there's moments in that movie where I, you know, get a little choked up. Like, it's genuinely well done. And I'm surprised that the guy that did Joker can get those performances and get those moments um, across on screen because Joker was, you know, garbage. Um, I watched it's Street funny Fighter, that you think it's garbage. Like I didn't. It's a terrible movie. It's, I I don't think it's terrible, hollow. but I think it's way overrated. I think it's yeah, beyond overrated. overrated. I don't know if I said this here, but my opinion about Joker is that every every part of that movie is firing on all cylinders, and it's beautifully done, except for the directing and the writing. I I agree. I think the visually it's interesting. I think the score is by far the best part of that mm -hmm. movie. I remember it's beautiful. The score is incredible. Joaquin is fantastic in it. The set design, um, all the costumes, everything is great except for the directing and the writing. Yeah, right, I agree because the the twists are so, like I wasn't surprised by anything in that movie. Not I was rolling my eyes me. out of the back of my fucking but head yeah, when they started I, doing too. the Batman stuff again. Yeah, I, I agree. It's just so shoehorned in. I agree. Uh, so this, I've actually had a, a decent amount of free time. Uh, Katrina started an acting class, and she's also been doing um, a lot of stuff with SAG. Uh, they've been doing mm. some town hall stuff and she's been, you know, three nights a week having to take, uh, you know, a couple hours off. So I've been able to do a lot of, uh, viewing. So I, I watched the entirety of Avatar, the last air mover and, uh, no, I, know, I know it's airbender. I just wanted to oh. troll. Uh, <laughs> that was nice. fantastic. I didn't watch it earlier, but I, I thought it was very good. I really enjoyed it. I got through all three seasons in like a week. Nice. Uh, I've never watched it. It's really good, and I That's think I right somebody now, was just posting about it today. Actually, I I think right now with everything we have going on, it actually is it really works. There's there's race issues in there. There's there's uh yeah, that's what the, there's this love. There's hate. There's pe pe you know peaceful protesters. There's everything in it. It is was so far ahead of its time. I was very impressed with it. My brother loved it, but I was just a little too old to like, I'm not going to watch this cartoon, but and, you know, I had some time and I really, really enjoyed it. And I genuinely laughed out loud a lot while watching it. Um, nice. What else did we watch? Uh, we started watching the good place again. Katrina and I watched the oh, first yeah. season together and then she fell off of it. Uh, so she decided to start watching it. Uh, and I think really I told you I watched it. that. I watched that earlier this year. Yeah, it's so good. It's it's, it's so great. good. The the last season is some of the best television I've ever seen. Uh, oh. It's so good. And then uh, I I got The Last of Us too. I've been playing that all weekend. And uh, I so I've been playing some video games recently ooh. too. I played um, the first two Arkham Batman games, oh, and I so just started good. Arkham Knight. Arkham City is really fucking. Arkham cool, City man. is fantastic. I really enjoyed Spider Man, and I didn't realize that Arkham City was essentially the precursor to spider-man yeah as far no as it, swinging they, around it borrows city. so much from yeah, yeah spider-man yeah. it's just so spider-man doing arkham city yeah i agree um, so it was super cool i just and I, my point is i've been playing a lot of video games lately and i know last of us 2 just came out 
and I've heard nothing but good things about. Oh, it's fantastic! Uh, I hate series. it and love it. So at I kind of want to. I want to go back and play the first one so I can play the second one. You realistically, you don't need to. It gives you a pretty good I, recap. Um, I would. Have in fact, to. I, I probably be able... want it because the first game is so emotionally draining, and the second game even more so. And See, I, they, I, think, I think I have to do it though. They update they update the combat me- uh, mechanics a little bit in the newer one. And I, I thought about going back and doing the first one. I started the first one over again about six months ago. And I just, it's such a heavy game that How I honestly is, don't. I, is it like. It's, it's a pretty long game. Like I'd say it's yeah, over it's like 20 hours. Right? Yeah. Okay. It's, it's a long game and it gives you a really good recap of the first game at the beginning of the second game or of this game. And there's also some flashback scenes that kind of help fill you mm-hmm. in on some stuff. Right. If you remember the pl- the plot overall of the first game, I probably wouldn't go back just because of how heavy it is. Like this game playing the second one, I've, I've probably put in like maybe six or seven hours over the last three days. And it is, I love it <laughs> and I hate it because it is so emotionally yeah, just, draining. That's like just this, what we need, something else to drain our emotions. Yeah, well, this one's time. weird because they took, and I, I think it's actually a good thing and I think it's kind of important to, in terms of like, desensitizing but in this one like you kill somebody if you shoot them and depending on where you shoot them they may collapse and then take several seconds to die like they'll they won't attack you anymore but you might hear them moaning in pain for several seconds before they actually die cool. if there are multiple yeah, people around you'll hit they'll like they'll scream like if you or me were around and like the protagonist killed one of us like if they killed you i'd be like alex like they <laughs> scream like the npcs have like names and then there are also times where they like beg you for their life and if you don't kill them like if you run away eventually they come back so it's like you have to kill people that are begging for their own lives like it is you're really it's selling em- me this game right emotionally now. emotionally daunting but it is such an incredible game um i also watched street fighter oh you weren't supposed to watch that <laughs> we were going to cover that for phase two of our, our video game thing oh, yeah that's right i forgot about that it's all right yeah. I'll, I'll watch it again yeah, I'll watch so that good. movie anytime it's on. That's that's one of my I don't like saying guilty pleasures, so I'm just gonna say it's a pleasure. I love that film. It is so it's, bad, but it's so yeah, much it's fun. Terrible. It's I'm not so gonna watch now. Mortal Kombat. I'll, I'll hold off on that, and I'm genuinely excited to revisit that. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Um I think we should get back wait, into should the, we do Yeah. Well, yeah. I was gonna say let's get back into Lady let's Killers. Let's do it. Let's get Stop back into stalling. Lady Killers. Pitch it for me. Give me the elevator pitch. <laughs> this is Hmm. This is a movie about a little town with a big garbage problem. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so, uh, you know, this is a remake. It follows the same basic structure as a group of guys that want to plan a heist and they um, take up residence with an old woman who uh, presents a number of problems and they pull it off and she gets involved and they get their comeuppance. Um, but this version of the movie takes place in the South. Do we know what state it was in? Mississippi. I don't remember that. It was Mississippi. So this version of it takes place in the South. Um, the woman that they move in with is an old black woman instead of an old uh, white English woman. Um, and there's a number of black characters in the movie, uh, including Marlon Wayans, who's part of the crew. Um, <laughs> There's no people of color in the first movie. And, you know, it's 1955. I'm not going to give it a hard time for in it. London. But that was one of the nice things to see about this movie is that it was so I, uh, deeply rooted in the culture of the area that they chose to set it. And the music, too. about two white men, I guess they're white Jewish men, writing. And they this isn't the first movie they do. They have a bunch of stuff set in the South. But writing something that's so deeply rooted in black culture and dropping N bombs so often. Um, I have a few answers for that. I will say not as far as N bombs, but as far as, um, a white person writing primarily for a different culture that they're, you know, haven't been a part of. I just had that conversation with somebody else the other day because I'm working on a few scripts and I don't want to just write cis white men, but at the right. same time, like I don't want to, take too many liberties with something that maybe I don't really uh, understand. Yeah. You know? Um, so anyway, I don't have an answer for it. I think you just kind of try to do the best that you can and be open to other people. And and I think at least with the Coen brothers doing something 
that it, like obviously this is supposed to be in the early 2000s so it's supposed to be contemporary to when they made the film um and so it's very of the time but at least they're writing about culture like i don't feel like this movie is exploitive where like quentin tarantino for example i do think like he thinks that he has like the n-word pass because his mom dated a bunch of black guys when he was growing up and i think he he, i think he's also worked with a bunch of people of color that he has but i i do think with someone like him it is a little bit more exploitative like he uses i'm not gonna die on that hill (laughs) yeah he uses the word way more often than he needs to in his movies sure sometimes like i i I feel like it's a little i have a feeling i have a feeling just to sort of answer your question and wrap both of these things up without speaking for anybody i have a feeling that the coen brothers and tarantino maybe to a lesser extent get a pass because they do try to a use their clout to tell stories about people that we maybe otherwise wouldn't be seeing stories about that's true um especially in 2004 uh before everyone was woke and i think they or uh, i'm going to talk about the coen brothers now because i don't want to inadvertently get onto a tarantino hill that i might have to die on um (laughs) i think the coen brothers from what i read about and what i just see from the movie did on this and in general do a good job of researching the cultures that they're writing about and really trying to be true to those characters and not be exploitative right and i i do think that's fair i i I don't think the coen brothers are exploitative and I, and I do think, obviously, I'm putting a little bit of a 2020 lens on this. And I was reading, like, I know the Academy Awards, for example, just last week mentioned that they were going to put some, like, new rules and caveats about for a film to be eligible, there has to be some, like, diversity. They haven't actually said what the rules are or what the criteria are going to be. But there's going to be... not a case-by-case case basis, you know? Exactly. Because, like, yeah, obviously, if you're writing a movie, you know, that takes place in Iceland or something like that, how what are you going to do kind of thing so yeah i do obviously think you have to take it by a case by case basis i I wonder if a solution for a situation like that is that the um filmmakers make a point or more of a point of having a diverse crew behind the camera and i think that that's really important as well i think that's that's what you have to do but uh getting into this movie i think the biggest difference on this one is the first movie i i want to say is probably spent about 30 to 40 minutes on the comeuppance after the caper you know, the Mrs. W finding out what happened, them trying to convince Mrs. W not to snitch, and then them all inadvertently killing each other. This movie, it's 10 to 15, I would, I'd say maybe there's a good 20 minutes setting up the film, and then most of it's the caper, and it isn't until the last 25 minutes that the caper's done, and, like, they quickly go into their comeuppance. Like, it is an yeah, almost this... an afterthought in this one, them all getting... Oh, I... I, wouldn't I don't want to say an afterthought, far. but it, it's I think this, much quicker. This movie has a much more traditional third act, and it's much more efficient with the way that it gets through the characters' comeuppance. I don't, I don't think it's any less effective. I think they just move through it quicker because they're, and I think there's, you know, kind of a a '50s movies thing too. Not even a '50s movies thing. It's just the difference that seventy years. Uh, not 70 at that point. I'm thinking today. Almost 60. The, it's a difference that it's a, uh, it's, I think it's like exactly 50, 90, yeah. uh, 55 to yeah, 49. Yeah. It's the difference of 50 years of cinema. Coen brothers just move through that more efficiently. And I think it works too. I, I agree. Everything was in line with the characters. The pacing of this movie is, is really good. It's spectacular. And it has a bunch of my favorite actors. Uh, I, Tom the cast Hanks is incredible. Tom Hanks is great. JK Simmons. You put JK Simmons in anything. And you're going to elevate yeah. that movie. He, him and Tom Hanks. I mean, I really enjoyed multiple people. Him and Tom Hanks are two of my favorite parts. Um, two of my favorite actors in this movie. The old woman who actually won, and I don't have her name handy, but she actually won a, an award at Con for her performance. Uh, she's fantastic. Oh, she was she's great. So, she's so fucking annoying, but she's, you know, on purpose. Like that is the character. Right. And she's, she's amazing. And she's like, I shouldn't say she's annoying. She's she's a good person, and she wants to right. help people. But well, she's uh, she she's was, kind of a blowhard. She was the typical Southern Christian woman who's Just bring loud, up God every in five your face, seconds. judgmental, but still a good <laughs> person overall. Yeah. Who else in the cast is fantastic? Oh, I Marlon Wayans. Marlon Wayans is so good. This I movie made me wish that Marlon. Him in this movie. 
I, yeah, but that's the point. He's so annoying. He is, so, but I, I don't feel like he did much that separates him from a lot of his other roles. It's not annoying. He's he's abrasive. Um, yes. I don't know. I I'll say I miss seeing him in 2020 in roles. I, I I'd like to see him work a little bit more often. I'd like to see him not do the the spoof movies. I like yeah. to see him do another Requiem for a Dream or something. Or this. Yeah, he he was great in Requiem for a Dream. Like I know he has the capacity to be give some depth and nuance to performance, and I don't feel like this was that. Now, granted, it was the character, but I don't feel like it was much of a stretch for him. But then again, I don't know if this was a stretch for anybody. Like J.K. Simmons, oh, he's on, well I'm, within his wheelhouse. He's well within his wheelhouse. Tom Hanks. He, you know, he doesn't normally play the bad guy, you know, the mustache twirling bad guy. But even this, he was still very charming. So yeah. even this he was just elevated a little bit. Yeah. Some of his other roles. And then I, I did like uh, Lump, uh, the football player, but he didn't have yeah, much Opie. to do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he was good. Oh, Stephen Root is in this. Oh, yeah. My favorite he's the boss. Actor. He's fucking yeah, he's incredible. great. And he's only in like two scenes, but he's great. Uh, Bruce Campbell. Did you he recognize is him? a cameo. No speaking. He yeah he's the uh, the humane society the, for the animals the movie. yeah, yeah. On the commercial which <laughs> they put a the gas mask on the dog <laughs> <laughs> it dies and then he gives it CPR <laughs> that was a very convincing fake dog by the way that it J.K. Was. Simmons put his I, mouth I on thought, so it's funny so I was reading some reviews about this um, afterwards just to kind of see how these movies were re- like received and this movie's like you said, is probably an underrated film. A lot of people loved the original and said that this was a pointless remake, that it didn't do anything. And a lot of people said they didn't like the little like character pieces at the beginning of oh, the movie the, where he said, and I the thought characters, that was great. The, yeah, the characters and the crew are so much more interesting in this movie. Just the fact that you and I are talking about the performances of each one and we remember who they all are. Like, yeah. They're very specific. They, they, uh, and they all have a little bit of agency. They all have Mountain a part Girl, to dude. play. Like Mountain Girl. Mountain Girl was fantastic. That made me brought laugh. His bitch so to the hard. Waffle Hut. <laughs> that made me laugh so hard. I felt so bad for Mountain Girl at the end of I, the movie. Yeah. Yeah. They met at the um, Irritable Bow Singles Mixer, by the way. The only thing, I, I think the only thing I didn't like about this movie is I wish the IBS thing with J.K. Simmons' character Pancake happened a little earlier. Mr. Pancake. Like, it was very late into the film that it happened. Like it comes up. It wasn't until. They were already in the middle of the heist. And then it was all of a sudden like, now granted, IBS is brought up by stress. And when you're in the middle of the heist. I don't think it's in the middle of the heist. I think they bring it up once during during planning. Well, there's one time where his stomach rumbles and people look at him, but he doesn't say anything. And then while they're Yeah, that's all I need. Yeah. But then when they're in the middle of the heist, once the heist starts, it pops up so often. Like they have to stop the heist and go to the bathroom. It's a little unbalanced, I guess. Yeah. that's just a long scene though yeah um of them talking it's funny so it's like hard to yeah it's, it's just hard to figure I, out what the give I and take feel is like on they that could have done a little bit more with it or had it cause another problem i did like at the end when when pancakes uh gets killed and he gets strangled by um who who actually was the one who strangled the him? general the general that's the right general. um when he gets strangled like he's like, ooh, ooh, ooh. and so Mountain Girl's like, oh, the IBS. So you think he's like shitting yeah. himself, and then all of a sudden, yeah, you that's see what I'm saying. Well, I think that I, I that liked. was a nice, that was a nice payoff, and it was just a nice payoff that it interrupted um, the heist too. I thought, yeah, I don't know. Um, I I just feel like it came in a little late. I I feel like if it was brought up earlier in the movie, maybe it wouldn't have bothered me so much. But I I did I do like his death, thinking like, oh, he's shitting himself right now. That's disgusting. Oh, it really has a yeah. shit joke. Oh no, he just got strangled. I I liked how that kind of flipped my my expectations. Yeah, yeah. I I, I can kind of keep on going on about stuff I liked about this. Do you want to try and go in order of the plot and talk about what didn't work or what <sighs> changed? I like, I like the that cat. she rants about her piles, by the way. Is that which one? She rants about her piles, hemorrhoids. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> she just has like a five minute conversation with a painting about yeah. how. Did you notice that painting changed expressions throughout the movie? Yeah. That, I yeah. thought that was really funny. I had to look it up. I'm like, is it grimacing now or was it smiling <laughs> earlier? And then I looked it up and it changes like three or four times throughout the film. They do no, that in Knives I, Out, too. Oh, Knives Out. I fucking love that movie. Um, That's incredible. I. It's kind of similar like, to this movie too, actually. Yeah, I, I think so. Uh, not, very not similar mystery, but it's a characters it's, and the way it unfolds and 
Yeah, whatnot. it's an ensemble that takes place in a house and there's, you know, murder afoot. Yeah. So yeah. I, this movie, I really liked how they set up the Marcus in this one is uh, G.H. Door, played by Tom Hanks. And I like that this professor actually seems super intelligent. Like, he didn't just seem like he was good at planning robberies. Like, he actually seemed like an actual intellectual. Like, he knows about he's music. He's a learned he knows, man. Yeah, he actually is a very smart person. I like that Tom Hanks rides the line of being pretentious, too. Like, he yeah. definitely dips his toe into it, but it's not all the time. Yeah. And I think a, le a lesser actor would have been, would have come off pretentious the whole time. I agree. And Tom Hanks is kind of charming. I mean, Tom Hanks is charming. This yeah. character- He's America's dad. Is a little bit more charming than you think. Yeah. I, I agree. Like, every time he starts, to, you, you mentioned, like, he rides, that he toes that line. Every time he starts to see it, it's almost like his character is aware- that he can come off abrasive if he becomes too pretentious. So he'll start that he'll read the room and then adapt what he was going to say. Yeah. Uh, he was really good at that. Uh, I was going to save, I was going to save this note for the end, but since we're kind of on the topic now, we can, we can come back to this, but I feel like his, um, the, okay. The end of this movie kind of didn't work for me because the, when Tom Hanks gets knocked on the head with the gargoyle or whatever, something about it just felt like, it wasn't as much of a result of the heist or it didn't, it didn't feel like comeuppance in the same way that like the original did, even though he got hit on the head with something, but it was during a struggle and it felt more connected to their greed or something. And this time, and what you're talking about with his pretentiousness kind of plays into this. And it's the part of it that kind of works for me. It feels, he goes on like a little rant. Like he does, a, he monologues essentially to himself and that's when the thing falls and hits him on the head. Right. And I kind of appreciated that, he had this moment where he just lets his pretension go and he be, really becomes like a himself, like a mustache twirling. Yeah. Bad guy, uh, you know, archetype. And then that, you know, he kind of dies because of that, but I feel like it also kind of didn't work. So yeah. that was a little disappointing for me. I, I, I did find it strange where, you know, they keep dumping bodies every time someone gets killed. So the first person gets killed is Marlon Wayne's. Because he just keeps attacking J.K. Simmons' character Pancake in terms of you know bringing his girlfriend well, he, up, calling him lazy, yeah, calling he, it trying to get an extra share because he blew off his finger. Um, all these. So different he draws things. the short straw and has to go kill um, the old woman, and then he can't do it because she reminds him of his mom too much, and that leads to a, an argument with him and J.K. and they've been butting heads this whole time, the whole movie, and yeah so they you know he, marlon pulls a gun on him for the second time in this movie did you notice that he holds his gun like a teacup yeah he does, i did notice that i thought it was super weird uh I love it. so yeah he, he's like a fake gangster yeah he's yeah he's he's totally just playing he he's hard he is. uh yeah. but yeah he he go he pulls the gun on him again and i think that comes down to him not really knowing how to hold a gun because they scuffle <laughs> and he gets killed like immediately and we don't really yeah. see jk simmons get the gun but it's not hard to imagine that it was pretty easy to get that gun out of his hand because of the way he oh, I, don't, it. I don't i mean i have a minor squabble with you here we don't have to stay on it i don't think he got the gun from him i think marlon wayans was still holding it and they were just pushed up against each other yeah. and the gun went off and it happened to go into marlon i don't think jk simmons intended to kill him i don't well, actually he... though that th that might have been intentionally vague because J.K. Simmons was a little bit more a bastard than we realized because he tries to run off with the money. He tries to run off. Yeah, he absolutely tries to run off the, the so money. Maybe that was intentionally vague. I, I I agree that it was intentionally vague. I think that he was trying to get his hand on it, and I don't think it would be hard to get the gun to face away from you if you were in that situation when he's holding the gun so limply. So yeah. uh, I limply. I thought that was great. I thought you know the general. I thought the general was fun. He has almost no lines in the movie. I think he speaks what twice really enjoyed in the whole, that character. Yeah. He speaks yeah. what twice in the whole film. Uh, yeah. He keeps smoking, even though he's not supposed to be smoking the house. He just he sucks like sucks it up into his mouth, sucks it up into his mouth, flips it back out while it's still lit. Yeah. Uh, and he goes to kill the, the um, kill the woman at Mrs. Brunson. And he just ends up tripping over this cat that just causes havoc. Like in this movie, I feel like the cat caused the more brothers trouble. love their cats. Yeah. But this is the same cat from inside Lewin Davis. Oh, maybe. There's also a Jew with a guitar reference in this movie, which I thought was funny. Where? Somebody, somebody, somebody says something about a Jew with a guitar. Oh, did they? I missed just it. Like, yeah, it's just like a throwaway line in conversation. But, that I yeah, this cat replaces the parrot. So in the first movie, there's three parrots that keep getting out of the house that they keep having to get. In this one, the cat keeps getting out. But at one point, J.K. Simmons blows off his fingers 
making a bomb and telling people, being all pretentious, being like, you got to be safe and careful around bombs, and blows his hand up. And the cat <laughs> runs off with his finger, and then the movie ends with the cat dropping the finger onto like the Love same that. type of barge that everybody Love just that. kept dropping bodies on. Can we talk about how many barges there are in this city, by the way? A lot. There's a barge going by every time they have to dump a body. Five people die that night, and each one of them goes into a six people, and each one of them goes into a barge. Yep, it's crazy. And What's I, funny I mean, is they don't even try not to really hide the bodies. But... They put garbage bags over their heads, and then they drop them over, yeah. and you still see their legs hanging out. I, it stuck out to me, but I'm not really complaining because this is like it's elevated from real life. It's yeah, it's, it's ta- not folk supposed tale. to be real life. But it, yeah, I just yeah. thought it was funny. It's just like every time you fall, you just see the legs falling. Um, yeah. I thought it, it is funny, though, that like this little town has an entire island devoted to garbage. Garbage. Where they're yeah. constantly bringing these massive barges. Multiple like, times a night. from the entire state? Like, how do they have this much garbage? It's a sleepy little town. I know, right? It was funny. But I, I thought it was really funny because the they needed something to replace the trains. No, I thought it was good. I thought it was a good choice. I don't have any yeah. complaints about oh, it. You know I just we, think it's funny to talk about. We didn't bring up this entire time talking about this movie. This movie, The House, was much more important to the plot because they actually dug right. a tunnel. So it makes sense think, why they needed this particular house and why they had to deal with this woman. The house was in close proximity to the place that they were robbing, which is um, a casino, a floating, riverboat casino. A riverboat casino. And it has a an office that's on land, and they dig a tunnel from the old woman's basement or root cellar to the office. And I think that works so much better than uh, the original movie. And we're talking about how boring the robbery is in the original movie. Like, the heist is a massive part of this movie. I think it's done really well, and there's still tons of uh, character building during the during the heist, so it's not purely plot. And it just makes it makes everything tie together in a much more satisfying way that keeps you oh, engaged I agree. throughout the movie it, which is which it actually made it like, seem like they were competent. the Coen brothers it, it the fact that that they can make a change like that and make everything tie together makes the ending with tom hanks feel like a little bit more of a unsatisfying or like missed opportunity and which makes me wonder if i'm missing something about I, it because I, see, I what i didn't like about the ending was i do like the train thing ending because it was just like you know like the guy not paying attention to his surroundings like if he was the smart guy that we'd seen him be in the entire movie and he was paying attention he could have avoided dying but that was just him being careless there was nothing tom hanks uh as dh uh, gh door could have done to avoid that there's no way he could have known so like yeah i, I can feel... see all that and it's also like just it doesn't feel karmic and maybe it's also because we watched the original one in such close proximity to this one in that when you see the bird land on it and you see the crack, we knew instantly what was going to happen where maybe it would have felt more like karma. Cause you know, you, some people call crows soul chickens and whatever. Like maybe it would have seemed more like karma getting him if we hadn't just watched the other one. Like it, it's almost like a divine force giving him justice because religion does pay, play a big part in this movie in that mm-hmm. she, um, she is very religious. She donates her five dollars a month to I can't remember what Bob Jones or something. Bob Jones, which is a very racist institution, has a very deep history in racism. Um, but she's donating the movie her money. Movie feels like there's a little indictment of her uh, her beliefs too. Yeah, and then at the end of the movie, when she she's like, "Look, I won't turn you in, but you we gotta turn the money in. We won't say where we got it, and you have to go to church." Like she really believes that they can get their salvation if they go to church. So I think maybe the ending is is almost like a spiritual, supernatural way of saying, like, something we need good to win in this movie, and she's good. Yeah, I think I think you're right. Um, something about it still, something about Tom Hanks getting knocked on the head with the gargoyle just, like, didn't, didn't work quite well enough for me. I see. I figured the gargoyle was going to come into play at some point because they showed it so often in the movie. Like the movie starts sure. with a gargoyle. So that didn't bother me. I don't me even mind that it's a gargoyle. It's just like the way that that moment is paced out or something. Yeah. I can't, even, I can't put my finger on it. It's just yeah, like it, I, I do some agree little tweak. that maybe like something could have, they could have let it breathe a little bit longer or something. I do agree that it felt oh, a I think it should rushed. have happened quicker. I think it's too removed from hmm. the from the struggle it's not even a struggle with lump in the original it's a struggle but i think that's where i think the original makes more sense because it feels like a an it feels like the last action beat i agree and like i did like a, i did like the final time pacing thing. in the original better yeah and then with tom hanks 
Lump kind of offs himself, which yeah. is kind of like, oh, it's not an action thing. Um, it's just a random act of violence. And then Tom Hanks like talks to himself for a while and just you feels know what slow, I think would have been dies. better. I, I, I think if I were rewriting, if I was rewriting a Coen Brothers film, <laughs> <laughs> I think maybe what would have been better would have been if maybe there was another round in the chamber or something and Lump, you know, maybe after he shoots himself initially, maybe he gets another shot off and misses and it hits the gargoyle. And that's what caused the crack. And so it still ties in. Maybe that would have been something that could have been yeah. more interesting. I don't know. If if somehow Or maybe or maybe if Tom Hanks that. was Yeah. Or maybe if Tom Hanks was um in some way responsible for Lump. Like maybe Lump still makes a mistake that ends up killing himself, but Tom Hanks is just kind of standing there. I feel like if he was a little bit more responsible for that, you know, if he just kind of put his thumb on the scale that ended up with lumps. I death, agree. Then it would feel like a little bit more retribution when he dies. Like, um, I, I think you know, that's fair proximity, but you know, we're, uh, I'm, I'm complaining about a very small part. Of yeah. So what's funny is a this fantastic movie a, by two fantastic. Films. A lot of people think this is their weakest film. And if this is the weakest film in your, your film library, like that's pretty fucking good. Yeah, I mean that implies that it's a weak film, which I don't. Think I it is. I don't think it is either. I I thought it was very enjoyable. I liked everybody in it. I thought everybody, with like, with, with the, the exception of I just wish Marlon Wayans had a little bit more to do. I felt like he was a little bit He's of a, a caricature. comic reliefy. Yeah, I think he was yeah. a little bit of a caricature. He gets that moment with his mom at the end. That's and I think that's, that's the only be... thing that I think saves it. But and he... I I did like the scene where he was going. But even to his... that feels a little contrived yeah and it just feels like we're talking about um you know non-poc people writing poc characters and that's kind of what i thought of when that moment happened i was like oh yeah the black the black dude is gonna have a soft spot for his mom, mom. because this old black woman I did, reminds him i did of, like I the know. scene with his boss when he was like apologizing and they like bribed yeah. him the hundred dollars um i mm -hmm. did like that scene but other than that i don't feel he had much to do and i think I think he did everything he could with that character, but I would have liked to see, I feel like everybody else had a moment like where they, the character did something that they got to chew the fat a little bit. And I don't think he really got that, but uh, overall, I think this is oh. a fantastic film. I think this is the second Coen brothers film we've covered on this stuff. We did a uh, true grit and I, I honestly think true grit is probably one of the greatest remakes of all time. And mm -hmm. I think this was pretty damn good as well. Yeah, I mean, I would, I think the first one is unique and super well done, but it's also a little dated. Um, and I think this one improves on it, frankly. I, I agree too. I think it getting to know the characters a little bit more, letting the plot breathe a little bit, and, and putting some effort into the heist made a big difference. Like, I, I felt like this and was an actual crew who knew what they were doing and. Yeah, could have gotten and like away. we said, tying the heist to the reason that they move into this woman's house in the first place. I agree. It's a world of difference to me. I was gonna. I had one more question to ask you. Um, who do you think is the biggest liability on the crew? <sighs> it would have. It would have had to been Gawain McSam, played by Mar Marlon. Um... Wayne's, or it would have had to be Pancake by J.K. Simmons. It, it's it's I, those two. Yeah, I, Marlon well, Wayans got funny, fired, and if if he was able to get his job back, the whole thing the would have fallen apart. Yeah, I think it's uh, I think it's J.K. Simmons, man. I think J.K. Simmons is is a hothead. I think he um, is I don't know what the word for it is. He's got kind of a white savior thing going on, and he shows a he little does. bit of it when he's oh, talking he does. about it. Oh, that's he's right. Like, Listen, I was a I came down writer. here with the freedom. You writers. have yeah. the you have the right to vote because of me. You should be thanking me. That's it's right. Like, oh, slow your roll buddy that's um, right so he's he's kind of like a like a i don't know secret bigot or whatever um he ends up betraying everybody he's the only person that genuinely betrays the entire crew yeah he brings in mountain girl which is fucked up he brings his bitch to the waffle, waffle hut. house it's the waffle hut in this movie right um <laughs> My yeah so i think he <laughs> I, I, had to, I, I had to think about it a little bit during the that movie is i think tricky. mr pancakes I, was you make some good big points liability. but ultimately the plot and he fucks up the bomb in the in the tunnel. 
Yeah, that was just a collapse, but they already had the money. Like in a pinch, they could have just got the money and booked it. But I do. Well, but I, the old woman knew. All he might be the stuff. worst character. I'll definitely give you that. And, and by worst character, I mean he's the worst person. Yeah. But he's that you know he's interesting. But yeah, I really liked this movie. Yeah, man, it was fantastic. I'm glad we watched it. Right. I'm glad that we're not bashing a movie. Yeah, no, it's <laughs> it's week. good. Um, uh, yeah, we're gonna talk about the news now. M- movie news. So to get through the news real quick, uh, we don't have a ton of a ton of news, but uh, first one update on our bet. Uh, AMC announced they're going to open up uh, a large portion of their theaters, about half their theaters, July 15th, and they expect to have 90% of their theaters open by Tenet, the day Tenet comes out, which is now July 31st. So it's looking like uh, I'm going to win the bet. By a few hours. Yeah. It's opening on the last day of the month. Yeah. So the official day is the 31st, but that means we have early screenings on the 30th. They're, oh, fuck that. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't matter. It's, it's still coming out in July. Um, I got a bone to pick with AMC, by the way. Oh, yeah? Because they announced that at first, that when they were reopening, they announced that they would not be requiring people to wear masks yeah, now in the theater. Yeah, now they are. And, yeah, and people, there was a massive public outcry. And, like, two days later, they reversed that decision. It was which, the next day. Uh, I mean, whatever. It, it, I think they're fucking idiots for not seeing that coming. Yeah. And they said that they didn't want to drag themselves into a political... Uh, conversation. I think that's so fucking ridiculous. That is political. It's I had, just stupid. You you have to have known that there was going to be I had this friend with it. today on Facebook. I posted a thing that said, you know, because I've, I've been seeing so many people like, I'm not going to live my life in fear. You know, red, white, and blue. These colors don't run. <laughs> like, I'm not going to live my life in fear. So I posted something along the lines of like, wearing your seatbelt while driving, you're not living in fear. Or riding a bicycle helmet, you're not riding, you know, living your life in fear. Why is wearing a mask living in fear? Like, show some fucking compassion right so i had this friend yeah. go yeah but you know you have to do it within reason like i'm not gonna wear a seat belt on my couch it's like but one you fucking can't you idiot <laughs> two like why are you arguing like i feel like you're arguing with me well, for the sake of arguing you're like he has a point though I-, I wear a condom when i piss so. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just like really dude come on that's for- absurd but uh let's get into the news and wrap this episode up uh yeah sorry <laughs> uh, so we already talked about the about tenant uh yeah. the other thing I that i had that. i think i had three stories but i forgot to switch this note over let me just pull up mine i've got one that i don't think you know about oh tell me michael keaton is in talks nope, to that's come on back my list Batman. motherfucker but i got to say it first yeah that's only because i went to get a oh amc was so amc oh joel schumacher passed away that was the third story yeah that's sad that is you know sad. i gotta say i i've been on the wrong side of history about that with i think a lot of people because we've been giving him shit for the two batmans that he did forever and motherfucker did uh falling down in lost boys yeah like those two batman movies are but a you also have to look at an otherwise wonderful career and batman, also, and uh, batman forever at the time was a hit it's not so bad it, and yeah, it's not, not so that bad, bad. It, now batman and robin specifically they gave him a much shorter timeline and they said hey we want you to have at least three batman costumes in there so we can have more action figures batman and robin was all about action figures it wasn't about making a batman movie where Batman yeah. Forever was, hey, do your new Batman movie. And it's it's got some good things in it. So I, I don't knock him for Batman F- Forever. I knock him a little bit for Batman and Robin. But when you look at the rest of his career, like those are like the only bad movie, quote unquote, bad yeah, movies he did. No, he was a fantastic filmmaker. So, yeah, it, so it's a bummer that he's, he's gone. And it is a bummer that his legacy, unfortunately, is those Batman movies. I think... Especially now that he now that he's gone, time is going to be a little bit uh, kinder. kinder to I him. agree. I hope so. Certainly. And, and also now that we've had all these other Batman movies yeah. too, I think but yeah, uh, it's much less precious than it was in the late '90s. But to your news, uh, Michael Keaton is in talks to reprise his role as an older Batman in the Flash. So as long as Flash, Flash has been movie. around, they've been talking about how they may end up using Flash um, to do Flashpoint to kind of do a soft reboot on the DC universe because, you know, they were never quite sure if uh, we, they were for a long time, they were calling Ben Affleck Schrodinger's bat. Like he was in the movie. He (laughs) wasn't going to do it anymore. He was going to do it again. He's not going to do it. And so they were just like, tell us about the flashpoint flash story. So the flashpoint story, essentially he goes back in time to try to prevent his mom from getting killed and ends up creating, going to like an alternate timeline. So the most famous version of the story uh, he goes back in time and 
uh, Bruce Wayne gets killed instead of um, his parents. So his dad becomes Batman and his mom becomes the Joker. So I don't think that's going to happen if they're bringing Michael Keaton in. But essentially, Flashpoint makes alternate timelines and alternate I, universes. I think the, uh, the assumption is that is going to happen. They were talking about um, the comedian. What's his name? The Fucking Canadian? The dude that bashes people's uh, heads in with a baseball bat. Oh, Negan? Jeffrey Dean Morgan? Yeah. There it is. They're talking about having him reprise his role as Thomas Wayne and then become that well, Batman. Well, they've been saying that for years, but I think if they're bringing Michael Keaton in... I, but it's two different Batmans because... Batman, uh, Michael Keaton is going to be Batman 89 from that universe. Right. I hope they do that. Thomas Wayne will be Batman from his universe. Well, so in the, over the last day, so so this news broke this morning. uh, Yeah. And they've, they said. We're on the cutting edge on this podcast. We're on the cutting edge on this podcast that's going to come out five days after the news broke. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) But we're recording it now, so. Fuck y'all. Uh, if you're on Patreon, you get it a little bit earlier. Yeah, the, on Patreon, you'll get it on Wednesday. Uh, or you, you got it on Wednesday. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it, th- there's also news that apparently Michael Keaton is in talks to do more than one movie and that maybe he'll be in the Supergirl movie and be like Nick Fury. Obviously, this is super early. He hasn't signed on for anything yet. So we'll see. I'm all about that idea. I think that's great. I still would love to see a one-off movie where they have Michael Keaton comes back, plays an old Batman, and we get a young Batman, Terry McGinnis, Terry Batman, McGinnis. Batman yeah. Beyond. I would love that. They're going to do some version of Terry McGinnis at some point. They'll have to. I mean, they probably... Yeah, they have to. I think it's not going to happen while Pat's in as Batman, but maybe in eight years. I think they'll have to, with especially with uh, having the new... For PlayStation 5, having the Miles Morales... Spider-Man, you had Miles Morales in Into the Spider-Verse. I think they're going to want to lean in and get away from the Bruce Wayne Batman for a little bit. It bumps me out we haven't gotten a good Robin Nightwing yet. Yeah. It would be cool if, I don't know if Michael Keaton's Batman would want to be involved necessarily, but I think they could do Batman Beyond with Terry McGinnis as an HBO Max series. That'd be so tight. I'd be totally cool. Live action. Set in the future, so it's completely separate from everything else. Yeah, I think it'd be cool. I, I would totally get HBO Max for two months to watch that. I have HBO Max and it's fantastic, dude. It's got a bunch of stuff on there. It's got, it's got I know it's got a ton of stuff. I was stuff. watching Space Ghost Coast to Coast. I'm waiting because I have a, so I don't have uh, HBO Go or anything on my own. I have a friend's password and they they pay for HBO, which means they get HBO Max. They just need to go and actually migrate their account over to the Max and they haven't done it yet. So I'm just waiting mm-hmm. for that. Yeah, man. It's, it's, a, it's a good thing. HBO Max, pay us money. <laughs> all right well i think that's the episode uh alex tell us where uh, our listeners can find you i'm on instagram at dysalexic d-y-s-a-l-e-x-i-c um and i am on twitter at polishi it's just my last name p is in paul u-l-i-s-c-i excellent and you, aren't you also on some like review site now too what, what are you doing now <laughs> oh yeah you mean that thing that i've talked about every week and just forgot to bring up this week you've only um, brought it up on the last episode bud i'm trying to i'm trying okay. to get you to plug your stuff yeah thanks no i appreciate you uh bailing me out and actually making me look dumber by by trying to correct <laughs> um i am also on this uh wonderful app called letterboxd hey Letterbox, pay us money um uh, letterbox <laughs> d with no e and I'm at Palicia on there, and I log all the movies that I watch so you can keep up with wow. what I'm watching. Oh, shit. Yeah. All right. You can check it's everything cool that's uh, MDX Pods related at mdxpods.com. We're on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at MDX Pods. Uh, if you want to support the show, I know right now uh, times are a little tough, but if you want to support the show, we are on Patreon at patreon.com slash MDX Pods as well. Uh, thanks for if listening. If you're able to after you've already donated to Black Lives Yeah, Matter do that first. All those other great causes. This is only if you want to and you have to obviously the podcast is free but uh if you want to throw a couple bucks our way by all means but yeah uh support black lives matter first don't you know what i'm editing the the patreon thing out we're not gonna plug patreon right now (laughs) trans rights are human rights also uh yeah for sure not just the the people that you find attractive trans people they're trans people and they deserve uh god thank god the supreme court two good decisions in a row that, yeah, both that, of those know, really you're talking me. about things getting worse and worse. That was a little bit of good news. Yeah, having having DACA keep going and then the uh, the equal rights. God, that was I was so worried about both of those. I'm very happy that at least that aspect of the government is still fun, somewhat working. So, 
Yeah. Thanks, yeah. SCOTUS. And uh, thanks to <laughs> yeah. our fans for listening. <laughs> Have a great week, everybody. <laughs>